morning. Thank, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, we're going to actually start with Larry Moore giving us the invocation, which he so graciously said he would do. <clears throat> so I have a couple of uh, quick announcements before we get started here. Um, one, I'm very excited to say if, if you're not part of the board or um, internal leadership with NEFA, I don't know if you would know about, they have a thing called the Bobo Award, where um, you can qualify for the Bobo Award based on participation, membership, um, political contributions, basically the quality and the uh, leadership and the way the organization is run helps you qualify for the Bobo Award. So last year, um, we were honored, honorable mention in the country, Lehigh Valley, uh, for a Bobo Award. And a lot of that had to do with Michelle and her leadership. So just a round of applause to Michelle. And <laughs> and to the group for the Bobo Award. So congratulations. Um, September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. And I'm going to read one of these proclamations, but we got a proclamation from both the mayor of Easton and the mayor of Bethlehem. And I'm going to quickly read this proclamation. Whereas the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors of the Lehigh Valley was founded in 1927 as the Lehigh Valley Association of Life Underwriters and is affiliated with the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors in Falls Church, Virginia, and whereas for generations, life insurance has been an important financial tool used to protect surviving family members and businesses from the financial devastation that could come with an unexpected death. And whereas life insurance allows families to maintain a standard of living following the death of an owner or a key employee. Recent surveys show that 68 million Americans have no life insurance. And those with coverage have far less than most experts recommend to ensure a secure financial future for their families. And whereas, as the NAFA Lehigh Valley campaign is designed to create an awareness of the important role life insurance plays as a financial tool in our society. The NAFA Lehigh Valley represents over 200 insurance and financial professionals throughout our region. Now, therefore, Salvatore Panto, Jr., Mayor of City of Easton, Pennsylvania, proclaims that the month of September as Life Insurance Awareness Month in Easton, and I urge our citizens to learn more about life insurance and its benefits. So that was from the mayor of Easton. We got a similar one from the mayor of Bethlehem. So, so I thought that's pretty neat. Um, so well done, because I think Michelle helped in getting that done. So thank you. I <clears throat> um, want to introduce a couple people. Brian Worrell is going to come up quickly. Where are you, Brian? Come on up, Brian. Good morning. Uh, I'm Brian Wuerl, and I'm the leadership development chairperson for NAFA Pennsylvania. And this past year, I was the moderator for the uh, Leadership and Life Institute that NAFA Pennsylvania sponsored. Your organization um, offered two of your members as students in that class this year, and they represented you very, very well. And I think you're going to see a lot of benefit as a local association from their participation. Uh, first off, I wanted to start off with what Lilly is. The NAFA Le Leadership and Life Institute is a program that's developed at the national level and it's executed at the state level to benefit NAFA members and the Federation. The Lilly curriculum is designed to develop leaders by fostering personal growth, enhancing business practices, and cultivating skills necessary for effective leadership. Lilly is based on the premise that leadership of others begins with oneself providing a unique learning environment that encourages participants to bring out the best in themselves and apply what is learned across every aspect of their lives. Lilly's a six-month leadership development program devoted to advancing your personal growth and professional success, and the course offers the best in leadership and personal development thinking, tools to improve your practice and create a business plan, increased understanding of self and improved interpersonal relationships, expanded professional network and opportunities for growth through Lilly alumni programs and leadership opportunities in NAFA. The four primary payoffs of Lilly are personal development and growth, stronger relationships with your family, business growth and development, and increased volunteerism in all facets of your life. 
Lilly directly addresses one of the primary objectives that many NAFA state associations are striving to overcome, the need for qualified leaders to envision and execute the objectives of the NAFA Federation. NAFA invests in Lilly by providing curriculum development, moderator training, and support courseware and promotional materials, and by fostering alumni initiatives. The Lilly curriculum is designed to be administered by state associations and is presented in six one-day sessions over a period of six months. Graduates tell us that Lilly program provides them with the tools and the knowledge to succeed, and 70% report a measurable increase in business growth since graduating. After graduation, the graduates commit to two years of association service, thereby ensuring a high quality pool of leaders in the future. As alumni become association leaders with better interpersonal and relationship skills, local and state associations can expect to be more successful at reaching their objectives. The reason I'm here specifically today is not just to do a commercial for Lilly, but typically at the end of the Lilly experience, we have a graduation and that graduation takes place at our state convention. Unfortunately, through some circumstances that you are already aware of and may, if you're not, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Uh, one of our graduates from your association, Mark Vertchak, was not able to attend that graduation. So rather than have him uh, forego that experience, uh, Lily felt and I felt that it was still important for him to participate in a modified version of that and for you to hear from him about his Lily experience. Um, Mark, this year, along with your colleagues in various locations throughout the country, you were the subject of a unique and exciting learning experience. Certainly when you're considering applying to Lilly, there was cautious interest and optimism about the possibilities. When you entered the room the first day, you knew only vaguely what to expect. Your moderator, me, suffered similar trepidation. For those of you who have not experienced Lilly firsthand or have wondered about it, allow me to give you a peek behind the curtain. What's Lilly about? It's about bringing your personal challenges to the group and being willing to share. It's about having an aha moment and understanding that things are beginning to make sense. It's about thinking that you can't watch one more sports-related movie and then looking back and seeing the powerful life lessons that they portray. It's about realizing that you don't have all the answers, but it's much easier when you realize what the real questions are. It's about seeing that you may need better balance in your life and realizing that you now have additional tools to help you achieve it. Finally, it's about seeing your future differently and making the decision to embrace it with confidence. Thank you, Mark, for the courage to step into the unknown. Thank you for sharing yourself with each other. Thank you for perseverance through snow, tax season, sore backs, flooded basements, family and work commitments, and me. Most of all, thank you for your commitment to take what you have gained back to your local association. My best hope for you is that the knowledge and the insight and the skills that you've developed in the last six months will be of immediate personal benefit to you. And I hope that this is only the beginning of your journey that takes you as far as you're willing to let it go. During the last six months, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. All of us in the class began lifelong relationships, mutual friendships, and an opportunity to encourage each other nurture those relationships. We've become personally important to each other. Mark, at this time, if you'd come forward and share some thoughts about your little experience. Thank you, Brian. Does, does everyone here know Brian? And how many, uh, and how many are, went through Lily? How many are Lily graduates? Okay, then you'll, you'll know the rest of the story I'm about to tell you. Part of this is about me, part of it's about Lily, and part of it's about Brian. On Mother's Day, I suffered a, a brain hemorrhage and wound up in Lehigh Valley Hospital. So after I found out that things were going to be okay, after I called my family, one of the first persons I called was my new good friend, Michelle Vitale, former, former president of Lehigh Valley. And I said, Michelle, I need your help. I have to call Brian and tell him I can't make the last class. And she said, I said, I know he's going to be upset because I can't make it, but I'm in the ICU. And she said, don't worry, I'll call him. So I said, please let me know what he says, because I know he's going to be disappointed. So Michelle said, I'll call him. So she calls him. She calls me back. She said, Mark, you were right. After he expressed his concerns about your health and welfare, he says, oh, I can't believe he's going to miss the last class. <laughs> Michelle said, Brian, he's in the ICU. Brian said,
said, apparently. Can he call in? <laughs> Michelle said, no, he can't call in. What about maybe Skyping? And she said, Brian, the ICU, you know, brain hemorrhage, <laughs> serious stuff. And then he finally said to her, apparently, getting the second hand from Michelle, aren't those ICU beds on wheels? <laughs> so, but all kidding aside, if, if I could have been wheeled to the last class of Lily, I would have been. But on doctor's orders, I couldn't basically even get out of bed. But it was truly a, a very good experience, one I would uh, highly recommend. I would do over in a heartbeat. I got to know Michelle Vitali well and became good friends with her and commiserated about raising young adult children on our rides through rain, sleet, and snow to Lancaster for six months. And it just was a great experience. So I would encourage anyone who hasn't been through it to think about signing up for it or perhaps even sending an associate because it truly is a great program and really should be continued and nourished and encouraged among the rest of our NAFA uh, fellow members. So thank you for your time. Mark, if you'll return, we have just two items here, or three items for you. Uh, this is Mark's uh, graduation diploma, and we have a picture of the class for you to remember us by. Yes, thank you. Here's the uh, program from the graduation ceremony. Thank you. And then I have a small gift for you also. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Mark. Um, I want to quickly introduce our sponsor. Uh, these meetings don't occur without our sponsorships. They're vitally important to the group. Um, I've got a bio packed between four bios. Um, but Mike Zile has joined Susquehanna Bank as Commercial Relationship Manager, Vice President in the Berks Lehigh Valley region. He's responsible for maintaining and developing commercial banking relationships and is based at Susquehanna's office on Tillman Street now in town. Michael previously worked as a business relationship manager, vice president for Wells Fargo Bank. He's currently a resident of Northampton and a lifelong resident of the Lehigh Valley. Michael has a history of involvement with community organizations. He served as both the assistant coach and head coach of Bethlehem Catholic Boys Volleyball and was the former manager of Bethlehem Special Olympics. Michael is still involved in youth sports as he is currently CYO Girls Volleyball Coach, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. He graduated from Moravian College with a bachelor's degree and is currently attending DeSales University for a master's degree in business administration. Michael is also a 2009 graduate of Leadership Lehigh Valley. So Michael, if you want to come up and briefly talk to us about your company and your bank. Thank you for the introduction, Joe, and thank you for the opportunity to come out here and uh, sponsor this meeting and to give you an overview of myself and also the bank. Um, first, uh, banking is such a tightly, uh, co it's a highly competitive industry. How many of you know of a banker here in the room? Okay, so you know bankers. Uh, some of you have gotten to know me, but you'll get to know me a little bit more beyond my, my profile. Um, there's a lot of competition. The banks are tightly regulated. And um, I've been in this area for a long time uh, in the Leah Valley. So as far as the people that are involved in insurance here, I'm a low risk guy. I've only lived in about a five mile radius my entire life. So I think you'll, you'll like that. Um, but uh, as far as uh, Susquehanna Bank, the, uh, the bank, that, that I work for, and I'll briefly skim through this just to give you a, a flavor of what we do at Susquehanna Bank. Um, Susquehanna Bank is a $17.5 billion asset size bank. In relation to all the banks here in the Lehigh Valley, there's, there's a lot of banks, but uh, we're a regional bank, and we're uh, about the, if you compare us to uh, National Penn and Lafayette Ambassador, Fulton Bank, uh, Fulton is about $18 billion in assets. Susquehanna Bank is actually over $17.5 billion. It's around $18 billion right now. National Penn is over $10 billion in assets. So as far as the regional players, that's where Susquehanna fits in. Uh, we're in uh, four different states, as you can see. Uh, 
some fast facts for you. And these are, that's the, the branch footprint, as you can see. Um, I'm in the, the Lehigh Valley, Berks region, but I focus on the Lehigh Valley market in particular. We have seven offices, uh, branch locations in the Lehigh Valley, and I'm, I focus on the commercial side. So primarily what I focus on is the deposit and loan relationships. Uh, Susquehanna's Roots, it's a Pennsylvania bank. So uh, it's based out of Lidditz, Pennsylvania, which is out by Lancaster. So I think it's, it's nice to know that we're here and we know the market. Susquehanna's mission, as you can see there, to help customers achieve their financial goals, de deliver superior return, and build economic strength. We have our star service commitments. So these are, these are the things that uh, I, I came over from Wells Fargo. Nice things to know that they, they really are um, focused on and, and we really believe in these, uh, these Bill of Rights for our customers. Uh, we work hard in the communities. How many of you have been to Iron Pigs games here in the Lehigh Valley? So one of the things that you might recognize is the uh, Strikeouts for Straight A's program. Uh, Susquehanna Bank was donating money and uh, over three million annually. Uh, we help the, the community. Uh, doing what counts for us, uh, a lot of the commercial banks might have more segmentation as far as who they're working with, with the, the businesses. So there might be a box. When I was at Wells Fargo, I focused on two million in revenue to 20 million in revenue size businesses. At Susquehanna, there's not, we, we really don't have that type of box per se. We're here in the local community. Uh, since we were, since we started on Main Street and Lidditz, we like to say that we're still a Main Street bank. So for how big we are, and we're the 38th largest commercial bank in the United States, we still like to stay a Main Street bank. So we have the size, but doing what counts refers to us making sure that we're not just thinking about this, this business that fits in the box. We're looking at everyone and we're, and we're helping them. The Susquehanna Business Services, uh, full service bank, we can do everything in-house. Um, from uh, one of the, the earlier uh, talks, Joe is mentioning, uh, you know, with, if somebody passes away or with, with life insurance or instances, one, one way in particular that you could think of Susquehanna Bank is if you do have an event like that where there's changes that are occurring, what you could do is after the meeting, we could get to know each other and, you know, we can always just, you could have another resource of somebody that's going to be able to get to know your business. Um, you know, if there's a divorce, if there's other types of events that come up, um, a death, we could talk to you and help you through that. Uh, small business, uh, the cash management services that we have for Susquehanna Business Services, so cash management, uh, we're able to do everything and safeguard the money that, uh, that businesses have. We could do um, a lot of remote type of services for businesses. That way, uh, if somebody is not close to one of our branch locations, they could just do it from their office. And that's, that's the, the trend anymore. A lot of businesses doing things from their office. Wealth management. I know Bob's going to be talking about trust. And we have the ability to help businesses with trust. So that, that's something that we could always talk to you about in the future. Uh, commercial finance, we have a leasing group. We could do up to 100% financing for, for uh, equipment. Um, there's another slide about wealth management. And these are all of our affiliates. So in the last slide here in particular is um, building enduring relationships. So for myself, I'm from the Lehigh Valley. I've been here my entire life. Uh, we realize that it's business isn't just, it doesn't happen in one particular day. You know, we'll all stay in touch with, uh, with everyone over time. And if there's opportunities that come up, you know, these, these long lasting relationships, if there's things that come up, we're here to help you. Um, so thank you all for having us. And, um, we appreciate the opportunity.
special needs. Uh, well, we have we have our wealth management group, and uh, I mean, I, after the the meeting, I could I could talk to people individually in regard to that. Where we're we're able to help all sizes of uh, businesses. Uh, sometimes banks are only really willing to work with uh, you know say a million in in assets or more, but we we don't really have that line in the sand. So we could we could talk to uh, to everyone on a case by case type basis if there's instances that come up. Thanks, Bob. Um, before we get to our key speaker, Mr. Rust, um, I just want to recognize R. Cardos, who um, is doing the filming today. Hopefully, I'm doing okay, Art. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about Art has a company called TV Marketing and Promotions. I know you've worked with Rob Tuzo from our office on some stuff, and I know he's very happy about the work that you did for him. Uh, but TV marketing for the past 22 years has been specializing in 30-second commercials and four-minute business profiles for both TV and the Internet. They also produce 30-minute television shows. They cover fundraising events and turn them into a 30-minute TV show, which can air on local service electric cable or others as well as we love upload it to YouTube and for web optimization to websites. So Art uh, graciously decided to film us today. We're, uh, we're excited. We're coming out with a new website, which I think is launched. Um, just about launched. Um, we're also working on our Facebook and our LinkedIn, and we're kind of, we're trying uh, to quickly come into this century with how we get information out to everybody um, and how we keep people aware of what's going on inside of NAPE and our organization. So um, thanks to Miriam for doing a lot of work in that area. Thank you, Art, for filming us today. Um, there's a couple minutes on Art. Talk to him if you have any opportunities in your business. Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce us to our two main speakers. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Jeff Boyer, who um, is joining us today to speak with Bob Rust. Um, Jeff Boyer is the president of Boyer Financial Group, an independent financial services group established in 1983 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Mr. Boyer holds the Certified Financial Planner, the CFP certification. His 25 plus years of financial service experience spans the field of financial planning, investments, insurance, and banking. Mr. Boyer is a registered representative of Walnut Street Securities as an investment advisor representative of PFG Financial Advisors, which is also a registered investment advisor. He's a founding director of Embassy Bank for the Lehigh Valley, a highly successful financial institution. He's a founder and past president and former chairman of the Lehigh Valley chapter of the International Association for Financial Planning. Mr. Boyer was instrumental in establishing the first financial planning professional organization in the Lehigh Valley, and he's currently a member of the Financial Planners Association. Sounds like you have a busy schedule. <laughs> um, uh, Bob Rust, I was going to read your bio, Bob. I thought I'd do you one better and uh, give you a plug. Um, I had a situation, multi-generational lumber company. Um, <clears throat> the client of mine was the president who was kind of entering into full ownership and presidency of the business. There was an uncle who was involved that was kind of um, causing a hard time for the owner because of the death of the mother. So it was a pretty uh, hairy situation. I referred Bob into really one of my best and most highly valued clients, and Bob did a great job in one, helping him navigate the legal issues around that exit and transition. Um, the, the feedback I got is that Bob listens. You know, he doesn't talk over your head. Um, he's available, he cares, he's professional. So um, I've got no issues recommending Bob to my clients. I know, the, I know the relationship that they will get when I bring Bob to the table, and I'd highly recommend using him if you, ha if you haven't used him. So, so Bob is going to leave this segment of our presentation, and without further ado, Bob Rust. Thank you, Joe. Um, before we get into the... Uh, actual program itself, I want to take a, uh, a moment to introduce at least, uh, where's Mr. Royer? Bill Royer, stand up please, sir. Bill is a, a former member of NAFA. He's the president of the Transition Group. Uh, if you all have not met Bill and uh, know what 
strategy does to help businesses increase their sales or deal with the HR problems, you ought to talk with them. Um, Irv Keister, where are you? Irv, were you recognized this morning at down at the Sales University? Uh, I signed a new Kisser report about the uh, This morning at the Sales, the Forum for Ethics in the Workplace focused on uh, urban renewal in that downtown Allentown um, with uh, Senator Brown, uh, Cy Traub, and Alan Jennings as part of a panel. Uh, and there'll be, <coughs> I'll put a plug in for that group, there'll be at least two more talking about the ethics of uh, that whole thing of moving to uh, uh, out of us uh, in, into the, uh, the downtown Allentown. But Irv, if he'd stayed, would have been recognized as one of three people that started that organization at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Emmaus. How many years ago? 14 years ago. It morphed and grew and grew and grew to the point where finally uh, it took an organization like the Sales and their Salesian Center to, uh, <clears throat> to run it. Uh, you'll be hearing more about their upcoming uh, programs as it relates to urban renewal shortly. And if you haven't been to one of the forums, I encourage you to go. It's a great place to network and you'll learn a, learn a lot as well. Uh, at your table, you've got those of you who are interested, there's a bio both on Art, who's a longtime friend, and, and uh, again, I echo what Joe said, of if you want to really promote your business, you need to talk with Art. An even longer-term friend is Mr. Jeffrey Boyer. I remember him when he was part of a bullpen of a, of a, um, of a company that's no longer around, but it was, at the time it was a 100-year-old company, uh, <clears throat> when he first started in the insurance business. Uh, Jeff's one of the most respected uh, financial advisors in the Valley, uh, Boyer Financial. He's going to serve a role with this morning for us in our presentation. Jeff's going to moderate, if you will, introduce, and then he'll be here to also follow through with you all in terms of questions and answers. Given his background and his credentials, if any of you shy about asking questions, he won't be. Uh, the uh, subject matter is uh, use of trust in business planning. Now, I had hoped to have a banker here as well, it didn't work out in that regard, but I am pleased uh, that we do have a very fine CPA firm who will make a presentation from their perspective in terms of the use of trust in business planning, and then I'll jump in and talk about it from a legal perspective. Jeff, if you want to start the program. Start the program. Thank you, Bob. Well, with all, those, with all that stuff about me, and it's not about me, it's about this group. It's about these guys here. Uh, Chris and Andy, uh, we talk about longstanding friends. Andy and I have known each other. The biggest difference between us is he still has hair and I don't. <laughs> I always kid him about that because we both have curly hair and I love that curl. Uh, Chris, Andy's firm goes back a number of years. The one thing I know about Andy is he's a very creative accountant and somebody who has been very wise in the way he does things. Chris joined him several years ago, and ultimately, I believe, will be the successor to the firm um, as it transitions over, over a period of years. But these guys are coming up and talk about numbers for you, and then Bob will be back talking about the legal side of, of trusts in business. Chris? Well, good morning. Thank you for the uh, introduction, the uh, opportunity to speak here uh, on a <clears throat> very, uh, what can be a simple matter or a very complex matter uh, when you get into trust. Um, we've, uh, we've worked with a client, a mutual client of ours with uh, Rust Firm, and um, it, it, that one has got about as complex as you can get as uh, it pretty much almost broke our tax software. <laughs> so... Uh, Kudos to you, Bob, for devising that, that one. Uh, so I'm going to touch on a couple of different trusts and, and tools that you can use to kind of help, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about trust, you want to help, you know, minimize estate tax, um, safeguard assets, and, uh, and then, of course, is if you can minimize taxes, that's always a good thing to do as well. So the, uh, the first one that I have here is a living trust. Uh, you know, one of the more popular trusts that you have. Um, 
it's it can be updated and changed as often as a uh, as your will is updated and changed, uh, and, and and just in case that uh, you wanted to safeguard assets in this type of trust, uh, excuse me, in this type of trust, you can um, you can do the best of both worlds, which basically you could title your assets in a limited partnership, such as a family limited partnership, and that would basically give you the protection of a lawsuit or against any kind of creditors, and then you would basically have the trust own the partnership. And that would give you the, uh, the protection um, against probate uh, when you get to that type of thing. What you want to be careful of that is not leaving too much income in the trust because, as I said, these things are complex. They're their own entity, and the tax rates aren't that kind to trust um, compared to individual rates. Uh, the next one that I have here is uh, an irrevocable life insurance trust. I'm sure to this group I don't need to talk about the benefit of life insurance. You all can do that much better than me. Uh, and um, we know how they have a substantial cash benefit um, as they build up time over, especially in a whole life policy. And um, we can set those up also to be where they'll pay your estate taxes, um, make funds immediately available to your survivors and um, helping avoid the delay of liquidating other assets that might be invested in you know, the market or bonds or something of that nature. The nice benefit of the, uh, what they call the ILIT, the irrevocable trust, is it will protect the policy's cash value, the death proceeds, and the distributions, while at the same time still giving you the control over where that money goes, how it's spent, who receives it, and when they receive it. Um, so you, there, that kind of brings in the factor of control for so much more as a liability. Uh, and the last one that I'll touch on before I turn things over to Andy, uh, which we'll have is a, is a lot of business owners as they're trying to segue and turn assets over maybe to their kid, if they belong in a company or a business, is, is children trust. Um, and these, again, can get as complex. Key part with those is once the child becomes age 21, they can have access to that, to all the funds in that trust. Um, and the only way to stop that is to have them consent at age 21 that they're, you know, that, that it can be delayed to a later date. So that would be a conversation you'd want to have with your kid maybe on their 20th birthday before you, you, you turn the keys over at age 21. So with that, I'll uh, cycle things over to Andy as he can give you a couple minutes on some. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to say first, before I start talking about trusts and, and things like that, I'd like to congratulate you particularly. Um, I've been interested in leadership since I was a student at Lehigh, and that was way back before Jeff and I invented dirt. Um, so it, uh, uh, it pleases me very much to know that, that both within and without this institution, there's uh, there's conscious thought and active education in the skills and techniques of leadership. I, I respect that a lot. Um, yeah, the, as Chris alluded to, in trust work, the thing to do is to try to um, get all the control that, that you wish to have without having any income inside a trust. Uh, I believe that this year, the 39.6% uh, tax rate started where trust income reaches $14,000. So there's a really good reason to find someplace else for the income to go. Um, and you know, having said that, and having said that all the, one of the biggest advantages of trust is you can control things in all manner of ways, much more creatively than you can with just about any other kind of organization. I will leave that to Bob to talk about. But uh, one of the interesting things that affects a, a, a business, a particularly a business, from the trust standpoint is what they call a Voluntary Employee Benefit Association, or a VEBA. VEBAs arose in 1928, but nobody knew, really knew about them until 1960 when the IRS proposed the first regulations. And in the beginning, they're a wonderful thing. So like anything else, there, things go along wonderfully well when they just haven't been noticed yet by Congress. Um, so, and, and things work very, very well. But in the last 10 years, for example, um, 
the rules around VEBAs have tightened a lot. Uh, you used to be able to put whatever you didn't want to put in your deferred comp plan or in your defined benefit plan. Um, you used to be able to put that into the VEBA and get a deduction for it and then take it out later when you felt like it. Um, doesn't work like that anymore. But if you have a business owner, basically the same kind of business owner that is appropriate for a defined contribution plan. You know, a 60-year-old business owner with 30-year-old employees who wants to quickly pack away a lot of money and has the cash to do it. Well, a, a VIBA will do the same thing with fewer restrictions, still a 501c9 organization. So the VIBA pays no tax, and the company gets an immediate deduction for funding a defined set of benefits. So if you have a client who is looking for a way to save taxes, get a tax-free benefit sometime in the future, and, uh, and, and, you know, it has to take care of employees in the way of TEFRA and ERISA and all those other things. But if you're looking for somebody who has that unique situation, a VEBA is a really good idea that not very many people talk about. Um, the other thing I wanted to address is uh, uh, the client that, that Chris alluded to earlier, the one that we share with Bob. Uh, Bob came to us and said, I have this client with gas property, and we think we can do this. Well, the, the this he was talking about was a trust with five subtrusts and five LLCs, all owning different stuff and with different sets of benefits for the different beneficiaries. And we had to call our software. Our software has 12,000 and some customers. And it's one of the two most popular software brands for CPAs to do complex tax returns on. They couldn't handle what he had. And we had to, we had to break it up into several entities and then kind of manually add them together to get it to, to actually file the tax return. But um, that is by way of showing how creative you can be with the basic trust format. It can be as simple as, I want my uncle to take care of my wife if I die. And it can be as complex as, well, the proceeds from this property go to that person, but only if something, something, something happens. And the proceeds of that property go to somebody else until, you know, their birthday, in which case it goes to somebody that we haven't talked about yet. So, I mean, it can be really complicated and, and, and convoluted, but Bob did a really good job of putting that together, and we really enjoyed uh, um, following it through and taking the details to where they go. So, uh, um, you know, and sort of in conclusion, I would say that uh, trusts are way too complex and way too expensive to just kind of form them on a whim or because the milkman said it was a good tax idea. Um, I would suggest talking to folks like Bob, like all of you guys, um, and who can refer to specialists or folks who know how to deliver all this stuff. But uh, please, um, keep them in mind when you're doing late in life planning for folks. Thank you. I think what we're hearing is a lot of creativity. And if you're over 50, as at least three of us are, the advantage is that you can really take the experience of these older people and use them in your practices. So Bob, would you come up and talk to us from the senior's creative point of view how to deal with trusts? That's where the family wanted to keep the assets within the family bloodline for generations. And control, therefore, was a key question. But it came to me from a 
gentleman I think most of you all know, one of the deans in the Valley when it comes to it being an insurance professional, namely John Eisenhardt, who's with the Mass Mutual um, Eastern Pennsylvania Group. Uh, these people are long-term clients of his, and that's how uh, I came to know them, and then I brought uh, the Werner and Company uh, uh, in, into the case. The, uh, I'm going to just take about five minutes at most. Uh, I just want to hit some highlights. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, now somebody like Dan Carley, who's one of the top professionals in the Valley as it relates to employee benefits, know this. But uh, Dan Crowley, rather, and that is that uh, trusts are used in a whole. The, the breadth of the use of trust is pretty, pretty amazing. It, it ranges from use of uh, trust within tax qualified employee benefit plans uh, to the use of them in a non, non uh, qualified ma manner, uh, embedded in a, a deferred compensation agreement, for example, uh, as well as business planning. Uh, using the trust uh, both internally within the company, also collaterally as it relates to the estate plan of the owner. One thing I would say with, without fear of being contradicted if anybody knows anything about trust, being a trustee is not for an amateur. It is a very complex, uh, very demanding job, unless the, the trust is really very, very simple and is a very short duration. Uh, you need to have uh, someone who knows what they're doing in terms of <clears throat> holding, managing, administering, investing, accounting for those assets, filing tax returns, etc. Namely, you need a corporate trustee like Susquehanna uh, and their other fine uh, uh, trust companies in the Valley too. I mentioned Susquehanna earlier about special needs trust. Uh, that may seem like it's something strictly for someone doing estate planning. I guarantee you it has an impact on business planning if the business owner has a special needs child or a grandchild. Uh, and it has direct impact on whether, what that grandparent or parent does or doesn't do for that special needs child. <clears throat> but the point being, you need someone who knows the law and knows it from a, uh, from a management perspective. So having a family co-trustee together with a corporate co-trustee may be, and often is, the best way to go. Second or thirdly, I would point out, and this is where age, Jeff, does come into play, the holistic approach. The client that's best served is the one that has all of his advisors in the room at the same time talking about the particular problem from their various perspectives. How often does that happen? Very rarely. Very rarely. Uh, it does need to happen, though. And each of us in our various professions, whether myself as an attorney, uh, Chris or, and Andy as an accountant, or any of you as insurance professionals or financial advisors, we need to seek that uh, kind of approach. And we need to back away if the client says, I want an insurance professional to be the quarterback. The attorney's got to have enough common sense to say, peace, I'm on the team. I'm a team player. Vice versa, the insurance professional needs to feel the same way a financial planner. If they've appointed Rose Lamassa, who to from RLB accounting firm, to be the uh, to be the quarterback uh, of the team. By the way, I don't know if I did I miss on you, Rose, in my introductions. Rose is uh, the current uh, chairman of the Lehigh Valley Consortium of Professional Organizations. As you know, NAFA played a big role in putting that together. Irv Keister is a, a past president of the organization. It's made up of uh, the Bar Association, the Pennsylvania chapters of uh, CPAs, uh, PICPA, uh, civil engineers, the Estate Planning Council, and NAFA, and real soon, as I understand it, may have some other professional organizations like the real estate brokers and bankers uh, and the medical society even joining the group. Um, and Rose is a very fine professional in her own, own uh, area of work. Uh, right now, starting to really get into the area of forensic accounting. Many of you all have clients that uh, have disputes, particularly among business owners or employees or husband and wife. Uh, forensic accounting can be very, very critical to the representation of, the, of, of your client. 
But my point is the, the holistic approach with the team is where the client is best served because each of us have our own perspective and we have our own skill set and our own experience. Trusts aren't for everybody. You'll see, uh, or, or for not for every circumstance, you'll see on the front page the list of both the advantages and the disadvantages. And Andy and Chris have already talked about some of the tax disadvantages that you need to be aware of. If you're going to hold income in that trust, you better tell the client, otherwise you're going to be in trouble if you don't, that uh, it's, it's potentially going to be subject to a, a, a very, very he heavy tax. If you flip the page over, there are some, just some examples of uh, the use of a trust in business planning. Now, each of these examples are real, and I might also mention that they are, in almost every case, somebody in this room besides myself had something to do with the, implement, the design uh, and or the implementation of the trust. But <coughs> starting just to give you just a flavor, the basic uh, points here are you can use a trust to, in fact, have your business continue to be run in the, uh, in the absence of the owner. And the owner is permanently disabled or dies. Uh, <coughs> you can use the trust to protect the assets of the business owner and also his family members. You can, as we alluded to a little bit ago, if you want to keep the business within the family bloodline uh, for generations, a trust can be used for that purpose. It can be used to level the playing field between children of a business owner, some of whom are in the business and some of whom are not, uh, particularly when it's tied together with the use of permanent life insurance. Some of uh, my professionals in, the, in this room with uh, outside of the insurance industry might sort of cringe when I use the word permanent life insurance, but if you fully understand the tax advantage and the, uh, the power when it's, when it's being, uh, that particular product is, has standing behind it a major company like a New York Life or uh, a Guardian or a Northwestern or a Mass Mutual, you can understand that, that um, putting those two together you can uh, really work uh, not only to secure the business ob objectives, but also the family estate objectives. And then finally, an area that both Dan and Ryan work in, the use of trust in a tax-qualified tax employee benefit plan. Uh, whether it be uh, a businessman or woman who's got to a point where the company is strong enough and needs to consider a 401k to attract and keep talent, uh, <coughs> or whether it's a more mature company that's successful and the owner wants to take value, the use of an ESOP. It's not for everybody, but if it's uh, properly um, studied and, and determined that the client does, is, a, is a candidate, and, and it takes a little time and it costs money, but it's really the safest way in the world for that owner to, uh, and most tax advantage way, for that owner to take value out, out of the company. These are areas that all of you work in one way or the other. And that last one, you really need players that understand the field. In other words, if someone asked me to, to draft a tr the trust within an ESOP, I'd have to, if I'm going to be honest, <coughs> I'd have to say that's above my, my pay grade. But I can bring in someone who can do that. And that goes back again to the holistic approach. There are going to be cases where any of us will be in a situation where it is beyond our experience or our skill set, and we've got to have the willingness or the, uh, the gumption uh, to bring somebody else in. You don't necessarily have to walk away. You can associate with someone else. And by the way, when I say insurance professionals, I don't mean just life uh, when that holistic team. I mean property and casualty at the outset uh, can may, may be the most important subject you're going to talk about. And uh, having someone in the, on that team that knows that subject uh, can be very, very important. Disability is another example. Probably the most uh, misunderstood and less appreciated of, of, of all of the uh, of all of the topics. Uh, I have not within underneath each one of those headings, you'll find some tantalizing tid tidbits. For example, where someone can use an irrevocable instrument and still have access to the money within the within the trust, it's feasible. It can be done. 
um, but you need to know what you're doing. Uh, and you need, again, the total team uh, uh, working on that. <coughs> there are things that <coughs> can be done creatively as it relates to the children in the business as well as the children that are not in the business. You might not consider this word creative, may not be the right word, but you can stipulate if that person that you've picked as the heir apparent uh, doesn't have, and I'm going to make this up, a 700 credit score. He's not going to take that new position of ownership until he gets it. Uh, or you can stipulate that uh, if, there, if the trustee has any reason to believe that that person needs to be tested for drugs uh, or for alcohol abuse, uh, in order to uh, go through that door of ownership and new responsibility, you can do it. A trust is what the settlor or the maker of the trust puts on paper, and then the trustee has to carry it out. But under each one of those examples, you'll find some pretty interesting tidbits of how you can uh, use a trust in business planning. With that, uh, Mr. Boyer, I'm going to turn it over to you. So my job is to field the questions from you guys back to the team here. And since I always know that no one wants to ask the first question, let me ask one. Bob, you were talking about restrictions in trusts. From a tax point of view, if you're using multiple step-down trusts, can't you, in essence, pass money from one trust to a second trust to the trust for the person, let's say, who has a drug issue, and in essence push the onus, and this goes back to you guys, the onus of the money being distributed or being held and taxed at a higher rate against that particular individual so as not to be the detriment to the rest of the people who may be trust beneficiaries. So let me let me throw that out to the three of you because I'm not sure I know the answer. Right, but you're you're what you're doing is you're pushing it off to the person who, in essence, is causing the problem. Okay. It might wind up that, that that is the least painful alternative. Good. Exactly. You pay for rehab. Exactly. You pay for rehab. That's that's a good that's a good thought. That's a good thought. So it can be done, and the point simply being the trusts are more than you know. Years ago, you know, it was put the money in the trust pass it on, maybe sprinkle it over a number of years, eventually pass the principal, it sounds like there's a whole lot more creativity that can be done with the attorneys and with the accountants. So who wants to ask the next question? Charlotte. Okay, for the benefit of the tape, if you have if you have a buy sell agreement, can you put a trust into the buy sell agreement? No. Would that would be the nature of the question? Well, it's true, but yes, you can. Uh, you want to elaborate? Well, you could have you could would solve the tax problem as well. And uh, Andy, a number of people are very aware of this. A number of uh, devices that's used is called intentionally defective. taxed from an income, income tax perspective uh, for the income on the, uh, on the trust, but from an estate tax perspective. 
just jump, jump off of that question. Some of us have businesses, especially where we are licensed in the security side, where that, that income has to be paid to us and not to another entity. So the question is, is there a way to go back to this concept of using a, uh, a trust either to own a company or a trust in a, in a buy-sell? Is there a way to take that money, pay it into the trust so that you have the provisions for taking care of those unfortunate life events and then turn around and pass it back out as income to the to the beneficiary, which is the business owner. So it's kind of going around in a circle, but in doing so, you've created you know, additional security or safety in the event something happens to that, in, that business owner. Is there anything there that makes sense? Well, I understand the question. I don't understand the question. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I'm just kind of chasing a rabbit trail. Well, I'm just saying that, that in, the, in, in the world of securities, right. we have to be paid individually. We can't be paid to an entity. Okay. So under those circumstances, I'm just, again, I'm looking for other creative ways for people who are looking at succession planning or transition planning or simply want additional safety because they're out there, in essence, as a sole flyer. Is there, is there any protection offered by a trust in that, in that uh, uh, scenario? Well, number one, Jeff, and Jeff, maybe I, I'm not fully understand, but obviously as a trustee, a trustee can retain anyone for their advice. So if you're, if you're investing in the securities of that trust, obviously they can pay you. But uh, your question is going to something deeper. down to the to the succession plan I think in the you know when I was when I was more involved in the insurance industry I recall recall that as being w2 income in the independent channel it's almost all 10, 1099 income because of the of the rules but also because of the way we're structured and I, I seem to remember that at the time that I was in the insurance side of the world, um, we actually had two entities. We had the, the W-2 side and we had the 1099 side. And so now at this, at this stage of, of my career and talking more and more with people on the succession side, you know, just looking to see if there's any creativity here that, that you know, can benefit people who have that situation, you know, regardless of their age. So that was the, that was the intent of the question. To the beneficiaries of the and then, trust, and then there could be other beneficiaries who had some interest for some reason. Okay. But but you know, the, the, going back to something that Chris 
said a while ago, is the, the assets of the company could then be in the trust, and as long as the income got distributed, then there wouldn't be that nasty trust taxation. Right. It would be taxed at an individual level at some point. And I'm sure that clever drafting could, could arrange for... Now, it, it is true that, that Learned Hand said um, you cannot attribute fruit to a tree other than that on which it grew. Right. So you can't take your whole income and give it to your grandchildren, but there might be a way to slide a little bit up. Did he not also say that you should structure your taxes, your income in such a way as to pay the least amount of taxes? Yes. My yeah. favorite Supreme Court justice <laughs> of all time. <laughs> Very good point. I have one other question over here, and then I guess we need to wrap it up. So you're asking, you know, is there a, is there an economic threshold, you know, both in income and also in assets to justify the cost of a trust? I mean, years ago, the company failed, and they, they, you know, that. Well, it's doable now. We're five million. It's like, what is that number? Well, uh, again, Susquehanna uh, Bank may give you one answer in terms of what amount they're willing to put under uh, their management. Um, I, there are some uh, uh, trust companies, trust managers, one of them, that would go much lower in terms of the total size of the assets than you might uh, imagine. But I think the large part of comes down to uh, answer the question of fees. Uh, the corporate trustees are going to charge X percent on the first 100000 and then it's going to be Jeff is a uh, large part of the service. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, that kind of approach, uh, another consideration, if you're going to make a family member or a business member a co trustee, you need to compensate. The project, the work that the Lord can do, put it in the middle, middle of that uh, more expense for that compensation. But, uh, the numbers I would have looked at, I'd love to try $100,000. It's sort of a threshold for myself. I know of at least two corporate trust, trust companies that will go lower than that. Well, I would say that uh, the, the deciding factor is really the client's sleep at night threshold. What lets them sleep at night? Now, if, if, if uh, 500000 at risk, if you will, uh, is what makes them worry themselves. Okay, that's the number. If two hundred thousand makes them think that I want to pay these fees and and do this work, but I really want the safety. Okay, it, it just depends on on how sensitive the client is, what the situation is. There's way too many variables to just say that there's a formula here. Yeah, another quick thing. I know we got to yeah. rush, but yeah. talk to Brian for. Yeah, really the cost of the business owner is going to be pretty, pretty 
split circles, not, not that much. He's talking to Dan about setting up the ESOP, and now you're talking to really big money. Uh, you're yeah. talking $100,000 just to do the first year. They're not, obviously, they're not a big client. So that's, they're not really a big client. They're not 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 a big client. They're if any minor child or disabled child is going to inherit any assets in the trust? Uh, Brian's raising a good question, and that's a that good point. And that is, if you build into the will, the trust that only comes into being upon the death of the second to die. Um, and at that point in time, and only at that point in time, will the trust come into being and the, the charges. Uh, good, good. Bob, Andy, Chris, thank you for your input. I think you guys could do, did a good job. Uh, I know we're short on time. Joe, I guess, are you coming back up to take to the next uh, to the next level? Yes. So come on up. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. All right, so I'm going to end the meeting. Um, quick story. September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. Uh, three years ago, if you don't know, I lost my mom, 55, to cancer. Um, I did her planning, my father's planning. I've got two young siblings. My mom's uh, was the second death claim I ever delivered to my dad. Uh, that life insurance benefit has put my sister through college. She's about to graduate next year. I've got a brother graduating from high school. I think he's going to go to Georgetown. Um, I've seen in my own family the impact of death benefit. Um, my mom, not that it mattered, owned life, whole life insurance and own term insurance. Um, I know after death occurs, the family doesn't care what kind of insurance it was, right? It's, at the end of the day, it's not about the kind. It's about having it in place and protecting your family. That's why I believe passionately about NAFA. Uh, NAFA protects our ability to protect people. Um, end of story. The way that we cause action is with money because that's what politicians care about. They care about getting reelected, and they care about money. Um, money talks. So we have the IFA PAC. I'm proud to say that all of our board members have made a PAC contribution. Uh, so if you can give to PAC, if you have it in your means, I'd highly recommend it. I'd appreciate it. The other thing, too, is the health of this organization is all of our responsibilities. So if you could find one person this year that you could come to make a member, whether they're new to the business or experienced, um, the little bit of money that they give goes to Washington, and it fights on our behalf to keep the tax rules in place that protect us and protect our clients. It's important. Uh, and I know when I was young in the business, I didn't think about it, and I always thought it was somebody else out there doing it. But the reality is, is the people that are fighting on your behalf, they look like you. They run practices like you. They've just decided to get involved. Um, so I thank everyone for your time. I know everybody's got things to do. Thank you for being here today. Bill, you've got to come. Thank you. I'd like to just just jump jump off of that question. Some of us have businesses, especially where we are licensed in the security side, where that that income has to be paid to us and not to another entity. 
So the question is, is there a way to go back to this concept of using a, uh, a trust either to own a company or trust in a, in a buy-sell? Is there a way to take that money, pay it into the trust so that you have the provisions for taking care of those unfortunate life events and then turn around and pass it back out as income to the to the beneficiary, which is the business owner. So it's kind of going around in a circle, but in doing so, you've created, you know, additional security or safety in the event something happens to that in, that business owner. Is there anything there that makes sense? Well, I understand the question. I don't understand the question. <laughs> I'm just yeah, I'm just kind of chasing a rabbit trail. Well, I'm just saying that, that in, the, in, in the world of securities, right. we have to be paid individually. We can't be paid to an entity. Okay. So under those circumstances, I'm just, again, I'm looking for other creative ways for people who are looking at succession planning or transition planning or simply want additional safety because they're out there, in essence, as a sole flyer. Is there, is there any protection offered by a trust in that, in that uh, uh, scenario? Well, number one, Jeff, again, maybe I, uh, I'm not fully understanding, but obviously as a trustee, a trustee can retain anyone for their advice. So if you're, if you're investing in the securities of that trust, obviously they can pay you. But uh, your question is going to something deeper. My mind, Andy and Chris jump in, is that you can draft the document in such a way to make sure that whatever you want done in terms of the income uh, to go to specific parties and parties uh, is so stated, and you give the trustee the extraction of discretion to take the tax bite and give it back to his discretion or hers, or the, or the corporate trustee, they believe that that threshold is not going to Okay. 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 down to the to the succession plan I think in the you know when I was when I was more involved in the insurance industry I recur, recall that as being w2 income in the independent channel it's almost all 10, 1099 income because of the of the rules but also because of the way we're structured and I, I seem to remember that at the time that I was in the insurance side of the world, um, we actually had two entities. We had the, the W-2 side and we had the 1099 side. And so now at this, at this stage of, of my career and talking more and more with people on the succession side, you know, just looking to see if there's any creativity here that, that you know, can benefit people who have that situation, you know, regardless of their age. So that was the, that was the intent of the question. the standard medical management company where um, you would get the 1099 and you would pay it over to the management company, right. which would be owned by the trust, which would then pay you um, some sort of compensation, and it could be W-2 or 1099 at that stage. To, um, to the beneficiaries of the trust. Then, and then there could be other beneficiaries who had some interest for some reason. Okay. as long as the income got distributed, then there wouldn't be that 
nasty trust taxation, right. it would be taxed at an individual level at some point. And I'm sure that clever drafting could could arrange for it. Now, it is true that that learned hand said um, you cannot attribute fruit to a tree other than that on which it grew. Right. So you can't take your whole income and give it to your grandchildren, but there might be a way to slide a little bit up. Did he not also say that you should structure your taxes, your income in such a way as to pay the least amount of taxes? Yes. My yeah. favorite Supreme Court justice of all time. <laughs> over here and then I guess we need to wrap it up. So you're asking, you know, is there a, is there an economic yeah, threshold, right. you know, both in income and also in assets to justify the cost of a trust? Right. I mean, years ago, six hundred thousand with the state, you know, taxes. Well, it's doable now with five million. It's like, what is that number? Well, uh, again, uh, Susquehanna Bank may give you one answer.
obviously waives the economic rule of thumb. If any minor child or disabled child is going to inherit any asset, to the trust. Uh, Ryan's raising a good question, and that, that's a good point, and that is if you build it the will, the trust that only comes into being upon the death of the second to die, um, and at that point in time, and only at that point in time, will the trust come into being and the charges. Good, good. Bob, Andy, Chris, thank you for your input. I think you guys could do did a good job. Uh, I know we're short on time. Joe, I guess are you coming back up to take to the next uh, to the next level? Yes. So come on up. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm going to end the meeting. Um, quick story. September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. Uh, three years ago, if you don't know, I lost my mom, 55, to cancer. Um, I did her planning, my father's planning. I've got two young siblings. My mom's uh, was the second death claim I ever delivered to my dad. Uh, that life insurance benefit has put my sister through college. She's about to graduate next year. I've got a brother graduating from high school. I think he's going to go to Georgetown. Um, I've seen in my own family the impact of death benefit. Um, my mom, not that it mattered, owned life, whole life insurance and own term insurance. Um, I know after death occurs, the family doesn't care what kind of insurance it was, right? It's, at the end of the day, it's not about the kind. It's about having it in place and protecting your family. That's why I believe passionately about NAFA. Uh, NAFA protects our ability to protect people. Um, end of story. The way that we uh, cause action is with money because that's what politicians care about. They care about getting reelected, and they care about money. Um, money talks. So we have the IFA PAC. I'm proud to say that all of our board members have made a PAC contribution. Uh, so if you can give to PAC, if you have it in your means, I'd highly recommend it. I'd appreciate it. The other thing, too, is the health of this organization is all of our responsibilities. So if you could find one person this year that you could come to make a member, whether they're new to the business or experienced, um, the little bit of money that they give goes to Washington, and it fights on our behalf to keep the tax rules in place that protect us and protect our clients. It's important. Uh, and I know when I was young in the business, I didn't think about it, and I always thought it was somebody else out there doing it. But the reality is, is the people that are fighting on your behalf, they look like you. They run practices like you. They've just decided to get involved. Um, so I thank everyone for your time. I know everybody's got things to do. Thank you for being here today.